Hi, I'm Todd, and I'm back to talk more of Basic and Expert D&D. So, last video, uh, you can look for the one before this, there aren't that many at the moment, so it shouldn't be hard to find, was sort of more of an overview of the X, uh, mostly the basic part. And today I'm going to delve a bit more into running the game and some of the more specifics. So, I guess the first thing to talk about is if you're creating a character for dx uh, it's extremely simple everyone can run their different house rules and whatnot and you'll find many dungeon masters will have their own way of doing things but by the book you're basically going to write down all the attributes for your character which is should be familiar to anybody who's played any other version of D, &D before or as you can see here on good old borg you know strength intelligence wisdom dexterity constitution and charisma you're going to roll three six-sided dice, add them together, and you're going to do that in order. Um, just, as I say, three to six down the line. So you're just going to keep rolling until you finish, and then you'll roll a die for your hit points uh, and your armor class. These other ones are pretty much going to be determined by your equipment. You also roll for how much starting gold you get, which will help you buy equipment to fill out all that. But basically, that's it. You don't really have to worry about backstories. Um, in modern D&D &D and a lot of other role modern games, backstories are very important. Uh, dungeon Masters often appreciate a good backstory because it ties the character into the fiction. It gives them goals that they can accomplish that the Dungeon Master can use to build plot hooks. And it's not that you can't have them in Basic Expert or in old school D&D &D in general but they're not the driving force that you sometimes see with more modern games. Uh, this is not a game about you fulfilling a past crime. It can be, but that's not really how the game is built. For one thing, you're not promised anything. Your character, Borg, or whomever you create, has no uh, lock on making it through to the end of a particular campaign. They could die in the first room or the first dungeon. They could die before getting to the dungeon. They're not special. You start out as basically a potentially special individual, slightly better than uh, just your average normal person. There are some advantages to being a PC. You tend to be a little bit better at hitting things. You don't necessarily get more health, um, but you are a little bit better just that little bit it's sort of like uh you know if you're playing the house versus playing as a person coming in playing a, a, a gambling any kind of gamble usually the odds that favor the house are very small but they're slight enough that over time the house wins same thing uh, a pc is just slightly enough better than a regular normal person that over time they're better but it's very slight and it's not something that you're really going to see come up very much and it's certainly not enough that's going to guarantee them any sort of success. You are not guaranteed to make it through. This is not your story. It's the story of the survivors. So you may start a campaign with your group, and each player has you know, their character, and you may end whatever the campaign, the module, the dungeon, the adventure, and none of the characters that everyone started with could survive. It could be a totally different set. Or maybe it'll be some of them will survive and some of them won't some, you know, whatever combination. But you're not guaranteed to make it to the end. So if you create an elaborate backstory that, oh, you were the, the long lost son of the king of the elves and you died in a, and all your family died in a fire and you were swept away and the currents took you to a farmer and all this, that, that's all good, but it doesn't guarantee you anything. You being the long lost son of the king of elves could then die in obscurity. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, but it's something that if you're going to spend a lot of time working this backstory that you want to fulfill, giving yourself some kind of destiny, you can't do that. Uh, unless the GM, the Dungeon Master, you know, really, and you as a group kind of play that sort of game where you're going to be taking care of these characters and ensuring that they survive, it's just the fact that the lifespan can be very short. So it's generally favored backstories that are also very short. Another thing is generally with the kind of old school approach is there's a certain gaminess to it that's accepted. A lot of times you find in a modern game that player characters need some reason to be together. We need some motivation. Why are we traveling together? Why are we 
doing these things we're doing together? What is keeping us together as a group? And a lot of times, at least in my experience playing these older versions of the game, is that kind of party cohesion is taken for granted. Just as a player, you know that you're sitting in the bar, you, you're at a table, you know that all the other players are playing characters who are sitting at the bar, and something's going to happen, and it's going to be like, who can solve this problem? And all three, four, five of you players are going to raise your character's hand and say, we can solve it, and then you just kind of go. And it doesn't tend to be a big deal about, well, why did you sign up, and why did you sign up, and why did you? You just kind of take it for granted, right? It's part of the fact that it is a game, and we understand that. And there wasn't an emphasis on that you know, Borg here, who's a you know lawful fighter, needs to have some kind of reason in their story or in their character makeup to be traveling with another character who may be of a different class or a different race or however it turns out. A note on the racist class thing, because as you're going through and you're creating your character, and you're you're going to see that that humans have a choice of all the classes, but if you're an elf, if you're a dwarf, you're a halfling, you're going to see that there is no class choice. The, your species is your class. And that can be off-putting to some people. And I know that there are lots of, <clears throat> you can read online for different people's reasoning as to why this is a good thing or it's a bad thing or what it means fictionally. I think some people can go back and say, if you look at something like Lord of the Rings, there was kind of just one dwarf example of who left the Dwarven kingdoms to travel. And that's kind of the archetype of this dwarf who leaves. Or the same thing maybe with Legolas as an elf. And I'm not sure exactly what the ultimate reasoning is for why this was done. But in essence, as in much things with the basic expert, it's a bit of a simplification. In the original you know, white box, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, there was no race as class. However, the non-human races were extremely limited in what they could play. So you would see that, hey, as a dwarf, you could play a fighter only. You know, as an elf, you could play a magic user fighter only. Um, I think the same thing for halflings might have been also that you could only play a fighter. And I think that changes a little bit with Greyhawk, which is the first kind of supplement or one of the first supplements that introduces thieves into the mix. But basically, even though it wasn't, limiting you saying hey all elves must be like this it sort of was because it didn't give you at least out of the box any other choices for class they didn't say elves are all this is how all elves are as a template but it did say that you know all elves are basically fighter magic user combos so i think as part of the simplification looking at it again and maybe it didn't make sense or maybe they felt like it made more sense just to say hey look you're a dwarf this is what dwarf are dwarfs are or these are what at least adventuring dwarves are, um, from the standpoint of that the kind of world that Dungeons and Dragons kind of modeled on is sort of a human dominant world, that this is what dwarves are like, instead of saying, hey, you're a dwarf, but you can only be a fighter. Um, you know, maybe in some ways that was a, a poor move because if you can foresee adding classes later on, maybe it makes more sense to say, hey, look, dwarves can always only be fighters until we come up with this new class that dwarves can be in, you know, more, or is that more a more dwarf-suited class? But in any case, the decision was made, so if you pick an elf, you're just an elf. You're not an elf fighter, you're just an elf. If you pick a dwarf, you're just a dwarf. If you, that turns you off, it doesn't appeal to you, it's very easy to kind of undo that and just peel back a little bit um, using the white box and kind of uh, just tweaking the uh, XP tables. Um, to bring back the sort of race and class separation. But uh, from a practical standpoint, given the limitations, it doesn't make much of a difference uh, if you're going to play by the book and not sort of freelance your own stuff. Uh, I also want to talk about the uh, kind of player skill versus sort of character skill. Uh, in 5th edition and other modern games, maybe it started in as far back as second edition, and certainly in third edition, you know, they introduced the, the concept of having a lot of character skills and abilities, whether they're, it's, it's a feat uh, or an actual skill that sort of enables characters to do things. In this version of D&D, there isn't, or there's only really the thief skills. Um, everything else is sort of up to how you fictionally position your character and working with the, working with the dungeon master to figure out how to adjudicate whatever that's going to happen. And where this usually comes up is things like searching for traps or, uh, you know, trying to understand some kind of puzzle. And 
it's something that you see people who believe strongly one way or another. The the type who say, listen, I'm playing a wizard with 18 intelligence. They should know the answer to this, even though myself, a player who I do not believe has 18 intelligence, which would be kind of human maximum, can't do. So they should know. I shouldn't, you know, we should kind of roll that off or it should just be given to me because I'm a super smart wizard and that's my character. And there's the other one, other side of it, which is, hey, this is a game about player skill and so at some point it comes down to are you a good player and can you figure this out as opposed to trying to pretend what your character could figure out i don't really have much of a horse in the race i think they're they're both certainly valid ways to play the game from the standpoint of talking about this particular system this system weighs heavily on the side of what you as a player can figure out more than trying to figure out or give you the benefit of what your character should know. Your character knows what you know. And kind of on that topic, it, it does segue into sort of the concept of metagaming and how it applies to basic expert. You know, metagaming is often thought about as this idea of what you as a player may know about stuff that your character doesn't know. And how does that impact the decisions you make for your character? So if you as a player know something about gelatinous cubes, but your character's never seen one before and you and you encounter one, do you use the fact that you know as a player, hey, this is a gelatinous cube, I know gelatinous cubes are weak to this or we have to do that, and so I'm just going to have my character do that versus I'm going to play dumb and say even though as myself as a player I know all about gelatinous cubes, I know that Borg doesn't know anything about gelatinous cubes, so I'm going to play it dumb until I can figure out a way or there's an organic way for him to learn what I know about gelatinous cubes. Basic expert doesn't really have anything to say about that. The game, though, in general, is laid out so that it really takes advantage of what you as a player know, as opposed to trying to pretend what your player, what your characters may know. So things like and again, given the lethality, right, of how quickly you may die, you as a player are sort of forced to learn from your character's mistakes. If Borg the first goes down to the dungeon, falls into a, a pit because he wasn't using his 10-foot pole and checking out the, uh, you know, for pressure plates in front of him or trip wires, you can guarantee that Borg 2 is going to walk in that same dungeon with a 10-foot pole. And that's not something that the game tries to balance away from or try to get you to not do it pretty much is encouraged to learn from your mistakes if you're a player and your characters make mistakes learn from them because that's how your next characters are going to survive otherwise it would be a lot of frustrating sort of random chance as you're never allowed to figure out the sort of puzzles that your characters need to figure out to survive and one of those is, you know, checking for traps. Maybe you as a player, you would say, hey, listen, I don't know anything about using 10-foot poles to tap around and check for traps. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, and it might not. Or it might. It might make perfect sense to you. But whatever method you use to figure out, it's assumed that that's going to carry over from character to character. It's assumed that if you learn to do that, that your characters will then learn to do that same thing. Because otherwise, it'd just be too tough. And there's that allowance made for system mastery. you know. So that if you're playing with a bunch of experienced people, their first level characters are going to take all kinds of gear into the dungeon that probably, if you were trying to be fictionally pure, right, that this farmhand's not going to know to take iron spikes and a 10-foot pole and rope with a, a, a grappling hook and all this kind of other manner of stuff and caltrops. And they're not going to know to outfit themselves before going in the dungeon with all this gear. But of course, as players, we know that we've played over and over again, and we know that we're going to need iron spikes to keep doors open or keep doors shut. We're going to need caltrops to help us escape from something that's chasing us. We're going to need 10-foot poles to check for traps, and so that becomes part of your standard operating procedure. And it's totally legit. No one's going to call you out and say, hey, you're metagaming. You're a farmer who's 16 years old and never seen uh, you know, the outside of their own farm is not going to know about that stuff. It's, it's not important to the way the game, the game works. And in fact, the game would be much harder if you couldn't bring that knowledge that you've gained with you. So one of the things I mentioned 
in the last video, at least I touched upon it, is the kind of use of random encounters as sort of part of the the, the clocks, the mechanisms that kind of keep the game turning. From a dungeon master standpoint, and I'm really a player standpoint, it's something that you're supposed to, or not supposed to, it's useful, and they certainly don't hide from you the fact that you should be aware of that when you're moving around, wherever it may be outside of a safe space, that you're going to be subject to random encounters. And it was something that I, I touched upon in the last video, is as a player, you really want to avoid the heck out of random encounters, because that's when a bad encounter can just multiply and multiply against you, you know, because it's when you're surprised, when you don't have a chance to plan for an encounter, particularly at low levels, that's where you can get wiped out really quickly because it's a bunch of, you're, you're let, allowing a bunch of variables that you can't control into the mix. And, you know, you want to avoid that as much as possible that sudden drain on your resources that you might not be accounting for because, as, as I mentioned before, that, that scarcity of resources, managing those resources, one of which is time, along with your health, along with potential weapons and supplies. And anytime you get a random encounter, that is a surprise drain that you really can't account for in your resources. If you're lucky, you can get, it, get, get through it without using any. But because it's random, because you, you cannot control how you get into that en encounter, it can be one where the choice is taken away from you. If you're surprised by monsters and they're basically in melee range and they roll up and they're uh, hostile, it's on. Whether you, know, you don't have a chance to try to escape, you, don't have a, you, you may not even have a chance to really defend yourself before they're attacking you. And that can, be, that can turn a successful expedition into a TPK really, really quickly. One of the interesting things about uh, in encounters in general is it's not that they happen all that often. Uh, the odds are not that high. It's By default, I think it's one in six. So you roll a six-sided die. If you get a one, you know, you get an encounter. But it's over time, they pile up. And, of course, being that they're random, you can get a really poor run of the dice where you can get two encounters, you know, in two hours back-to-back. The way that it's sort of parceled out is time is sort of set aside in blocks um, for simplicity, for ease of accounting. They're not trying to figure out how many seconds it takes for someone to do a particular thing. It basically comes down to 10-minute blocks, what they call the exploration turn. And you can do a few things in the exploration turn. You can move. I think it's about 120 feet. You can... Um, you know, you can mess around with searching for secret doors or searching a room for whatever I think... And, and they may not even say in the book, I think I use maybe a 10-foot square, 10 minutes per 10-foot square to basically search something. Um, but you have all these actions, and they basically default to taking about 10 minutes each. Combat is maybe the biggest exception where combat <clears throat> takes less than a minute. I think it's uh, depending, uh, well, it depends on, they always change with additions, and I always forget. I think it's maybe six seconds around at VX already. Basic expert, it might be 10 seconds around. In any case, chances are, um, and I think in the in the white box it might have been a minute, but it either it's going to be a few minutes or less than a minute, it's fast. But if you pretty much think about sort of whatever happens with combat and then the aftermath of combat, you can pretty much chalk that up to a, a one 10 minute block as well. And so whenever you go somewhere, you're chewing through these 10 minute blocks, right? And each one of those ha adds more tension into the expedition because the longer you go more chances of encounters rolling up that you're not looking for uh, your torches are burning down you are you know you're maybe you're going deeper in the dungeon and you know you're trying to do things you're trying to you know map and there's more of a chance of mistakes being made more of a chance of any kind of other planned events happening obviously anything you do run into whether you want to or whether you want to or not you know it, it not only does it decrease your resources but now it means it's extra be turns to get out of there if you know if you go in and it takes you two hours in to get into the dungeon then maybe it takes you an hour to get back out that's again more resources that you have to account for so every tick of these clocks are important for a few different ways that all kind of interact together and the interesting thing i guess is it's probably inevitable when you're looking at an addition like Basic Expert, which is trying to sort of simplify things and really make, particularly the basic side, 
make a introductory uh, gateway into the system is that some things end up being missing. So I happen to have the white box, which is that. This is one of the later ones. I actually have an earlier edition, but this is kind of my beater white box box. And it's great, and I would always recommend to read it. It's probably easier to read it actually going from basic or something like that that kind of gives you a nice layout and sort of can wade into the rules instead of kind of jumping in the deep end than going right to the white box. But there's a lot of detail in the white box that doesn't make it into basic. And when it comes to running basic, there's a lot of wisdom in here that, that you don't get back out. One of the big interesting changes, just in general, is that when they when they talk about dungeons in uh, the white box D and D, they talk about it in terms of the underworld. Now they still use the term dungeon, but they use it in terms of this concept called the underworld. Now, what is what is the underworld? Well, the underworld it's not meant to be like you're going to Hades or you know, that kind of mythical underworld, but it is meant to be pretty much a supernatural place, a place that obeys its own laws, it has its own rules, and as it is special, as it is sort of supernatural or quasi-supernatural, it doesn't have to obey the laws of our world precisely, or even the rules that might, you know, apply to your fictional world outside the underworld. And so there's a lot of interesting bits in here where it goes into uh, how, how this underworld is different. And uh, one of the ways, or some of the ways that it's different is, for example, um, doors tend to swing shut behind you in the underworld. You open a door, one, no doors just open for you. Regardless of their condition, you have to force them. So right, right from the offing, the underworld is working against you. Uh, if you're a monster, monster the doors, they say, will open for a monster. A monster can just pass right through, never has trouble opening a door. As soon as a you know player character comes along or someone aligned with a player character, um, they got to force the doors open. So right there you have this kind of, they're kind of reinforcing this concept. If, you, if you're a denizen of the dungeon, it reacts differently to you, almost as if it were a living thing, than if you are a player, if you are a character, if you are an NPC who's with characters. Or basically, if you're an interloper from the surface, um, it reacts differently towards you. Doors are doors are all jammed shut. Not only are they jammed shut, but if you open them, there's a good chance they will close shut behind you, which is one of the reasons why you like to carry around your iron spikes. I mean, they're basically like a big sort of railroad spike or maybe not quite that large, but this railroad spike, and the idea behind using of the these spikes is either to keep doors open or keep them shut. Because as you know, these rules that I just mentioned talk about, if you're a monster, doors just default can open for them. So how do you keep it shut? You have to jam it shut. By the same token, doors will shut behind you and jam again. So how do you keep them open? If you want to make sure you can get out in a timely manner, you try to jam them open. So... Right there, it's giving you both sort of these strange otherworldly ways in which the underworld works, but it's also telling you about the tools you need to take on the underworld, which is something that Basic doesn't really talk about. They don't mention these things. They don't mention any special rules. They also don't really give you any clues as to what equipment might help you. Um, what certain things can do. Another thing that you can do is uh, that's mentioned in the white box that they don't talk about in basic or expert as far as I know is that you can use your rations basically to bait monsters into leaving you alone. If a monster's chasing you and you toss a ration behind you, if it's you know an unintelligent kind of monster, there's a good chance or some chance that it'll stop and snack on your ration, leave you alone. So there's another use for a resource that you might have thought, well, what do I need rations for in the dungeon? Well, that might be why. If, if you're being chased by giant centipedes in the dungeon, throw a ration behind you, and we'll roll some dice, and we'll see if the ration distracts them long enough for you to get away. They also have rules in there for determining, you know, 
how to check to see if monsters pursue you and for how long they pursue you and what happens when they come to locked doors and things like that. So while, you know, basic expert does a tremendous job kind of laying everything out for you, if you have a chance to go back and look at the white box, uh, it really does add some extra information, some uh, extra goodies for both as a player and as, as, a, as a GM for, you know, this kind of the dungeon, you know, sort of as an, as an, as an underworld. And where that underworld comes in is not just in doors and not just in sort of the way monsters operate, but it, it feeds back into talking about random encounters in the sense that if I generate a random encounter, it doesn't mean as a, as a, as a dungeon master, if I'm running a, a, a dungeon expedition, a random encounter should not, and it does not have to appear random to the players. And it's, I think that's a fairly good distinction because sometimes I think people run games and random encounters and it's just sort of like, uh, they just kind of throw it out there. Oh, suddenly there's uh, it's an ogre and I don't know what the ogre's doing there. You don't know either, but it's there and now we'll fight. And that doesn't have to be the case and it shouldn't be the case. It really is that the, as a, as a dungeon master, you should be taking the random encounters and then folding them into the fiction of the play. So if I'm running um, char players, characters, and they're running through, say, uh, a goblin uh, hideout, and I roll up an ogre, I take a minute and I think about, well, how could that ogre fit into this goblin hideout? And maybe it's maybe it's the leader. Maybe they, maybe the goblins work for the ogre. Maybe the ogre is kind of just some hired muscle that they got, you know, that they they brought in and they convinced to work with them. Maybe they took a prisoner. Uh, maybe it's just doing what we're doing. It, it just got here before us. It came in through another entrance, and it's looking for treasure and murdering goblins, just like we're looking for treasure and murdering goblins. And certainly that's something that can come up because you will find when you're um, generating random encounters that you will get results like here's another adventuring party that's moving through and the idea is that they're here just like you're here um, I'll try to find the table if I can let's see if I can find talk for the adventure those are spells it's probably going to be somewhere here Pardon my part six monsters. That's combat still. Somewhere in here, there's a, there's a chart for rolling on, so you can look at what's coming where. But the point is, is that you're going to get a lot of results for different things in the dungeon, and it's up to you. Here we go. Wandering monsters, level one. You can see that the one of the you roll one, you're gonna there's gonna be an acolyte, a low level cleric. Uh, it's gonna be it could be bandits, it could be fire beetles. You have dwarves, gnomes. A lot of these are, are you know a dwarf, a gnome, a goblin, a halfling, a kobold. It's and the concept behind these tables is that it's random to you as the dungeon master, and then you take this result and you fold it into what you're doing. So. You think about something, and again, if nothing really makes sense, if it really seems just totally, you just can't make heads or tail of it, then just roll again, or pick something else you think makes sense. But the idea is not to make it sort of funhouse style, where just random stuff's just popping up wherever it happens to pop up. It's the idea that you're sort of creating the dungeon as you go. You're creating the fiction of the dungeon with using these sort of random results as fodder for your imagination. You know, you're taking them and you're turning them into something that is part of the dungeon, that seems part of it, that makes sense, right? It just happens that it was something, an element that was unexpected. It wasn't a monster that was sitting statically. And part of the, the, the great thing about random encounters is that, yes, you could take a dungeon, you could put all your encounters exactly where you want to, and then every so often you could start to move them around to try to signify that they're moving, that it's a living place. But that's hard. Um, maybe, you know, these days, maybe there are some apps out there you could 
create your own app that could sit there and move around a whole bunch of every time uh, an hour comes up, you could hit some kind of button and all these encounters are going to move around and they're going to shift and, and, and kind of make it seem alive. But random encounters really have that feeling of something that's alive, that you're not the only ones in this place, whatever this place is. If it's goblins, maybe there are kobolds there. We don't know why they're there. I'm going to figure it out. As players, you may need to figure it out, but we'll we'll come up with a fictional reasons why they're there and suddenly they're part of it. So maybe it started off as just a, a goblin hideout, but maybe I roll up and, oh, there are kobolds. Well, then I think about it. So, well, may, maybe it would make sense in this instinct that there's a clan of kobolds who have attached themselves to these goblins. Suddenly they have kobold allies. And now the world is a little bit different maybe than I thought about when I started. But... Um, now I, I have some inspiration to, I can feed that in, or I can say, oh, these kobolds snuck in the way you did, or they came in through somewhere else, or they're prisoners, or whatever it may be. But it does not, and it probably should not, for the most part, feel like everything's just thrown together. It should feel organic. And as a dungeon master, you know, take a minute when you roll up an encounter to, to see how it fits. Or how it should fit. And if you ever don't see that it fits, rather than stuff the encounter in any way, roll again. You know, find, uh, ignore it. Uh, do whatever it is that, that keeps things logically and fictionally consistent in a way that makes sense for your world and for this place. But I think that in a lot of modern games, you get so caught up in trying to follow a particular path or stay on a particular timeline that they've sort of thrown away the baby with the bathwater in terms of running random encounters. Because yes, random encounters can slow things down, particularly if your party's gonna fight everything. You're gonna slow, it's gonna slow you down, sure. It's gonna add more unknown because every random encounter, there is a chance it's gonna go south, a good chance. And if it goes south, there's always a chance, uh, unlucky, to roll the dice that someone's gonna die. Even at high levels, you're always going to be subject to effects that are save and die, save or die. You know, there, it, it is, uh, there are low-level creatures, uh, a spider, that will kill you on a, on a, on a, on a bad roll. You know, you, it bites you. Uh, you. You fail your save on poison, and you can always fail a save, right? There is, let's see, which... So you got crab spiders, let's see, hit dice of two, black widows, hit dice of three, tarantulas. These are all ones that you could potentially run into in a low-level dungeon. Um, and yeah, they all have poison, 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 poison. And those poisons in basic expert, they're just fatal. It's not this is going to happen and that's going to happen and there's a chance you're going to die. It's uh, You're going to take the damage. Now look, the damage alone, 1d8, could kill you outright. If it doesn't, go ahead and roll for poison. You die outright again. And that's something those saves. Now, granted, at higher levels, if you have access to magic and you have magic users with the proper spells, there's you can come back from it. But, you know, these are still things that under the wrong circumstances at any time can just kill you. So, of course, that can be a bummer if you've been, you know, playing your whole campaign to see what happens to this one guy. And then he dies from spider bite at the first room of a dungeon that just happened to be random, that's tough. But I also think these are the things that, as players, all of us, that whether you're a dungeon master or a player, you, something to be embraced. And then you look at, well, how does the world respond? You know, it's sort of interesting to think about if, if you were playing a sort of a high fantasy, high kind of concept, high, you know, good versus evil of, say, a Lord of the Rings, what happens if Aragorn dies, you know? Does that just mean game over, Sauron wins? Or does somebody else now have to step up? Is that now, maybe it makes things more dire, but now whoever's left has to pick up the pieces and go on and figure out another way. And I think that, you know, as players and as dungeon masters, we should always be looking for not trying to stifle these strange things from happening that throw off our conception of the world, but embrace them and say, let's have these things that are world changing. And now, now what do we do, you know? And it may take you a minute, you may not have an answer off the top of your head, but it's worth thinking about, let's just play it out, you know? Instead of saying, well, we can't have that, I can't, I, I, I rolled for that save again, or I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna 
decide to flub the roll on the side so that the, the, the spider doesn't hit them. Or somehow they don't have poison because I'm afraid of what may happen. You know, let's let's roll with it and see how it goes. And it may be that this isn't the team of heroes that we thought, that it's going to be the next team that's a team. You know, the team that ends up being the Fellowship of the Ring that who survives and is triumphant. It's not necessarily the first team that sets out. It's the team that finishes. You know, it's that sort of difference between playing through a history that is messy or the real life rather that is messy and then reading the history book that is pick the threads that make it through one end of that messiness to the other and then tell you about them you know so that when you're reading about a battle or you're reading about a, any kind of period in history we we know from retrospect which are the threads that end up being the most important and the most impactful the ones the voices that survive and so those voices can amplify and but we know that in real life it's not that simple that there are many voices and many things happening and a lot of those threads just tangle themselves and go nowhere and then a few threads emerge on the other side and i think the spirit of playing these sorts of games are not to try to just play from the outset these are the threads that are going to make it these are the threads that are important but play through the messiness and all the emergent things that come with that sort of messy play and then at the end of it all you as everyone as players or the gm dungeon master will have a history at the end of it about the brave few who made it out of the maelstrom of all this death and dying and lived on to become great lords and ladies you know, and the great heroes of the realm. So I think, I'm trying to think about what else, if there's anything I missed as far as what I want to talk about. Um, I think that one of the great things about the system is, again, it's, it's simplicity in a sense. There is obviously a lot to running games, and I will probably try to make some videos about running games and prepping games and prepping campaigns and world building and all that kind of fun stuff. But those things are pretty much system agnostic, right? They don't depend on having one particular set of rules or another. I think one of the great things about, you know, this set, you know, in general and really old school, you know, whether it's white box, um, maybe ultimately white box, and if not this one, is that it really is a great chassis to build what you want on top of it. And that's because there are very few moving parts. I think that uh, that actually makes me think of one thing maybe to talk about is kind of the balancing issues or lack thereof. These kind of games, Basic Expert and you know White Box and these kind of old versions of the game are not terribly concerned with balance the way we think of balance now. The classes are not balanced against each other. A first level elf is by far more powerful than a first level fighter or a first level magic user or first level anything because they combine the strengths of two classes in one, right? They are fighter, they can wear armor, they can have weapons, uh, they can cast magic. They are very powerful, right? But there is a balancing factor. It's just not on that, on that particular, that's not how they choose to balance. They don't choose to balance it. Everyone at a certain level is the same power. How they balance it is in the experience required to go from level to level. So that, let's see, an elf to get to second level takes 4,000 experience points. By, let's contrast that with a fighter, takes half that. A fighter will get to third level if it gets the same experience that an elf needs to get to second level. A magic user will be somewhere between second and third level, just under third level, pretty much, before an elf gets to second level. And then to third level, you know, 8,000 experience, you know, everybody else is a lot higher than them. So you can see now that they're not balancing it by saying or trying to say that or prevent someone, a first level elf, from being more powerful. They're, they're basically saying, yeah, first level elf, elves in general are powerful but you gotta live a long time and you're not gonna be getting more hit points for a long time. You're not gonna be getting another spell slot for a long time. If you were just playing a human magic user, you'd be quicker. If you were playing a human fighter, you would be quicker. And you may not make it to level two elf ever. 
just because it takes so long. 8,000 experience versus other people are going to get twice that much. Chances are you will die before you get there. Or, you know, you're going to have to play it. You're going to play a different kind of game, right? You're going to start off more powerful, but you're going to, you're going to advance very slowly. Or you can start off weaker and you're going to advance faster. That's how they balance the classes together, which makes it very easy as a GM or someone who wants to design classes because you can look at these as sort of models. And really what the elf is, if we take away the theming of it as an elf, it really is a combination caster and combat specialist, right? It's a magic user fighter combo. So if I wanted to make a, maybe a differently flavored and tweak some of the, maybe tweak some of the elf abilities to be something else, but you know, I'm, I'm going to use that as my template. I could basically easily switch some things out and have a generic, here is your fighter magic user. And I could even look at it, I can even go further and say I could use that as a template if I want to introduce multi-classing, which basic expert does not have rules for, for multi-classing. At least I don't think they do. Um, you know, here's a way for you to do it. Here I can look at it and say, here is what it looks like. Right? It's more experience than both of them combined and whatever else. Maybe you, I think there is, probably elves get a little bit of extra experience or experience requirements because they do have some special abilities that are unique to being an elf. If I took those away, maybe I'd drop down the experience requirements a little bit. Basically, you're looking at, here's what a magic, here's what a dual class character looks like. By the same token, I think that um, clerics are great templates. And I think I wrote about this on my blog. I'll try to find a link and put it in the description. Are great templates for classes that have sort of some abilities. Because a cleric is a class that is a combo sort of ability person and spellcaster, right? And the ability for clerics is turn undead. That's not a spell. That is an ability that they have. Um, it has, you know, you can see when you're looking at clerics stuff how it let's see where is it let's see oh, maybe I passed it you can see how those oops I know it's here somewhere clerics turn on dead maybe they don't have it as a table or they do somewhere else but essentially it has a very clear level progression and Turn on Dead, actually, the, one of the reasons why it works so well as a template is not only does it have a progression for the cleric, it has a progression for things the cleric is targeting. Because just it so happens, and I don't know whether it was conscious or not, but the undead basically, their, H, their hit dice progress from basically, I think, half to one to two to three to four to five to six. And so you can really see sort of a progression of at level one, how do you fare against a target that is essentially also level one. So you, know, you can actually, and I think I've done this, you can basically genericize it to say, if it's your level, this is what you have to roll to succeed. If it's something that's more difficult than your skill level or your power level, then that's harder to do if it's, you know, it's less. So you can really play with that and it gives you a great template. Again, once you peel away the theming of it is to, here's a class that combines spell casting and abilities. Now, the interesting thing with that from, as I look at it, is I don't quite understand why they didn't do that for thieves. Because thief abilities don't work the way cleric's kind of turning does. Instead of basically cleric turning, I think it's a D, 2d6, and you look at the result and sort of compare it to where the difficulty is versus your level on a table and decide how well you succeeded or failed. Um, they went with the you know percentile dice. For things it's just a different way of doing it and it's an interesting decision on their part because like i said when i look at it i go wow the, the cleric kind of turning table is this great way of creating a table of abilities that can that scale with their level and then also you can look at how the obstacles scale with the level but they didn't do that with thieves and i'm not sure why but as a person who is if you want to adapt these rules again the thieving abilities is one that you can also use strip away the theming of the thief and you have basically here is your ability monkey you give them x amount of abilities and then you know they can scale those up or they can get better at them maybe this thief ability template works better whoops I just ripped that a little bit works better if um the obstacles don't really scale um 
and maybe the other one works better if the obstacles are expected to scale. Um, either way, you have these great templates that you can use. Um, as usual, I'm thinking of one thing, I think of something else. Uh, one of the other things, again, with going back to balancing really quickly is encounters are not really balanced either. Um, if we go back and we look at that list of uh, random encounters, there we go. This is for level one, right? Let's get it straight a little bit. You'll notice that you can get some pretty nasty combinations in here. You know, you can have, uh, let's see, you know, two to eight orcs, one to 10 giant shrews, three to 12 skeletons, you know, and again, each one of those, some of them are fairly high. So, you know, uh, if you're a first level character, those, uh, skeletons, you know, they're, or the giant shrews have two hit dice, so they're clearly stronger than you. They have a decent armor class. They're not pushovers, and you could potentially get 10 of them showing up. Uh, you know, that's, that's bad news. That's really bad news, and uh, is it seven? Their morale is not bad either, so they're, you know, it's not like they're going to run away at the first sign of trouble necessarily, so that's not balanced at all. Right, uh, you, it, there's nothing in this chart to say. Oh, if there, if I have three players, oh, if I have six players, oh, what level they are. You'll notice when they say level one, they're not talking about you as a party. This is not a player level. This is not the level of some kind of average. This is the level of the dungeon, and that's the balancing factor, and it's an important one when you're getting to creating things and how you how these kind of tables interact. And this also goes back to the sort of underworld concept that basic doesn't really talk about but it's kind of part of that same thought um and that is that things get harder the deeper down you go that you are you start at level one that's the easy part of the dungeon and that dungeons go down and you can have them reverse and you know reverse it and go up but basically the further away from the surface you get one way or the other it gets more difficult the, the thing is, is that you as a player know this as well as the GM. When you see those stairs leading down to the next level, you know it's going to get tougher. It's not something that it's a pri surprise. And it's not meant to make absolute logical sense as far as how you might think of a building. You know, the 20th story of a, a, a tower is not necessarily, has doesn't have stronger, may have higher ranking executives, but they're not necessarily more powerful in, in, a, in a sense than who, whoever's on the first floor. But that's not true for a dungeon at least in this classical sense. The further down you go, the further away from the entrance you go, the more dangerous things become. And the balancing factor is that A, as a player, you know this. You know if you find a shortcut that takes you down multiple levels of the dungeon, you're going potentially over your head. If you're a first level character and you say, wow, there's a stairwell and it goes down and it goes down to one level and I can keep going down, you know that if I keep going down, it's going to get super hard for me, super fast. And my margin for error is going to go down to zero. Now, you may still do it. And the reason is, is that the other balancing factor is that the rewards are better. You go down to the third level of the dungeon, the rewards are just the treasure that's there to, for the taking is supposed to be better than what's on the first level. So you then have the information to make a choice. Do I try to get what I can out of this first level? It's gonna be easier, it's gonna be more my speed, but it's gonna be slower. Or I could try to hightail it around, see if I can find that entrance to a lower level of the dungeon, a stairway, what have you, a well, a teleporter, whatever it is, and then maybe I can only manage one battle. Maybe if I work it right, I can avoid any kind of random trouble I can find something, maybe I can even find treasure that's unguarded or trapped or something I can deal with in a, in a way that's not going to kill me. Or maybe I just fight that one battle and I hope that get the treasure that I can get out of that and survive and hightail it out of there because the treasure, that one spot I will find on the third level is going to be you know three times better than what I find on the first level and I'd rather take my chances. So you're informed 
about what your decisions mean. And that's how the balance is. But it is not balanced in the fact that each encounter is supposed to be fair. You know, something I see on Reddit and things all the time, you know, is that, oh, I, my, my dungeon master, this encounter is too hard. It's, it's deadly. It's, it's like this game does not care. If you on the first level and, you know, you roll 12 wolves or 18 sprites, that's just, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. And now it's up to you to figure out what to do with it. The fact that it's coming from a table helps the dungeon master because you're not responsible. I think one of the things that happens in modern games is because so much of what the encounters are is what the GM has planned. If you're facing off against 12 wolves, I put them there. And so it's me taking that encounter, putting it in front of you, and I know what level you are. I know your capabilities are. So am I trying to just screw with you because that's how I'm going to get my fun as a GM or what the deal is or is there a trick or – here i can absolve myself hey man i didn't mean to do that i didn't do it at all it's the, the bad luck that you happen to find that these wolves had found some kind of hole in the floor of somewhere and snuck down in here and this is where they're keeping their cubs and they're having me 12 of them and they're all staring at you like that's just bad luck but you know deal with it but the fact that i didn't do this to you you know it was kind of done to both of us I have to deal with it. I have to figure out how that fits in. And you know, I have to, and then you as a player have to deal with it. Kind of puts us on an even even playing field. I'm not doing this to you. We're, we're exploring the dungeon together. I didn't know that those wolves were there until you guys opened the door and the wolves were there. Um, I'm as surprised as you are. Now let's let's see what you can do about it. You know, in that sense, it kind of you sort of have the more ability to be kind of a neutral. I'm just, you know, um, I'm just taking what's been given to me and trying to put it in a way that makes sense. You know, we're all just trying to interpret what the game is giving us as opposed to, no, I, I put this here for you, you know, to fight. So there's something kind of liberating about that. But in any case, it is not balanced. There is no fairness. Now, you know, I will say that you're not going to find the hardest monsters on here, right? So there's nothing here that is more than, you know, shade over three you know, hit dice. Then you come to, you know, if you look at level two, there's some things that are lower than three hit dice, and then you start to see, okay, there's four hit dice. I think that might be the toughest. And then you come to the third level, and there's a few fours. There's a bunch of threes. So, you know, things get more difficult. They don't put, you know, they don't put something super horrible on the first level of the dungeon. So I guess you could say that there's that little bit of balance. Though, you know, if I were to go back and compare it to the white box, this is something I think, again, they simplified because I'm pretty sure if I look up this table in here, it's going to show how if you roll a certain result, you will go to the next table up. So then if I'm on the first level of the dungeon and I roll, yep, here we go. So they do their table's a little bit different. So if you look at it right here, You'll see, okay, if I'm on the first level and I roll, I'm going to roll a number, and if I roll a one or a two, I'm using the first level table. If I roll, you know, if I roll the next thing, I go to the next. So there is a way to kind of scale up, not all the way, of course. Um but it's going gonna, it's gonna to scale up. So if I roll a six, if I'm on that first level, I'm going to roll a dice. If I roll one or two, yeah, you get that first level counter. Oh, okay, now you're going to get a second level counter. Uh, you could get a, okay, now you're getting a fourth level, the dungeon encounter, which is going to be significantly harder. Um, again, in, in basic, they sort of took that away. I think it's a neat thing to keep in there. Um, it's funny because I think as a general rule, I've, I've give this piece of advice a lot. You should never count your players to run away because they don't. So you should never build an encounter where I, I'm going to show you how to run away. I'm going to show you they need to run. I'm going to show you this enemy is so powerful you just need to get the heck out of dodge. doesn't work. You should never do it. But I find in these older games, perhaps because you're not playing someone who, when you look at their sheet, screams out, this guy is a hero and can take on the world, I find that when you're playing these games, you are much more apt 
to run away. Um, and again, I, I would never say plan the encounter to force you to run away, but I also think it makes it a little bit easier to put stuff in that's too difficult because you can run. I think the other thing that's just probably important to talk about is maybe the last thing as I'm yet again running long is when you're building dungeons you're building um locations these underworld spaces they cannot be linear if it's linear it's going to force the kinds of decisions that i think is what you find in a lot of modern games where players are going to feel like they have to press through each encounter that each encounter is a sort of linear step towards where they're going so that if you know if you have to get from a to z and all you can see is a then you have to go to b then to c then d <clears throat> for example you're going to look at each one of encounters if this is a necessary step i must overcome b to get to c i must overcome c to get to d and that means that you're going to look at encounters in a way that means i am as a player you're going to look at it like i am supposed to beat it that there clearly is a way i'm supposed to win i'm going to fight it because i have to i'm supposed to and these kind of mythical underworlds these mythical dungeons these dungeons full of random encounters no encounter is really are you supposed to at least certainly no random ones perhaps there's a location where you know you have to get to a door and there's some people there you know there there clearly will be occasions where you'll your hand will be forced you have to fight something but the vast majority of encounters should be non-linear either you don't have to fight them you can talk to them either you can run away you can go around them you can use some kind of trickery you can use diplomacy, like I said, talk to them again. Uh, whatever it is, wait them out, maybe they leave. Whatever it is, you have to have options because you because you are not expected to be facing encounters that are precisely your level. You are not expected to face encounters that you can necessarily beat uh, or at least beat by just going in head first. So you have to leave those doors open and your players have to know that those options are on the table. They have to know that, hey, you can learn to speak orcish or goblin or kobold and potentially talk to these things. You need to know that if you go into a dungeon, you absolutely don't have to, the first thing you see, just run and attack it. That, hey, it's fine to try another direction, pull back, maneuver, do whatever you have to do um, to get around it. You know, they look at all your options. Don't just settle for the straightforward approach. Now, if you're playing kind of more of a story-driven campaign one, you can end up in that kind of groove where each thing is a set piece, right? This is a set piece, and that's a set piece, and we're going to do all these set pieces, and we're going to get to the end. But the way these dungeons are laid out, the way that they're conceptualized in, this, in the rules is that they're not those kind of linear experiences. They are these kind of open spaces for you to explore that are dangerous, but the fact that they're open gives you lots of opportunities to find your own way through, over, past, around, um, anything to get you to the bottom line, which is that treasure, and you know, get out again in one piece, as opposed to something you're meant to clear out, uh, something that you're just meant to push down to the bottom of. You may never want to go to the bottom of a of a particular dungeon. Uh, the you know, the Castle Greyhawk and these things just keep getting deeper, and there was all kinds of fun, crazy stuff at the bottom of them. But there wasn't necessarily a finish line. That's kind of not what they were. They were sort of arenas for you to go in and do your best and then try to get out again as opposed to places that you beat. And the game, <clears throat> I, certainly the white box and basic or expert might as well, will even talk about what happens after you leave. How do the dungeons restock themselves? How do these things basically pull sort of a reset button and go back to being dangerous after they've been potentially you know cleared that's sort of how you know the game works and i think that when you're, as you're playing it if you can stay within that mind space instead of trying to imprint on the game that this is the sort of story i want to run is to really look at it from sort of this open-ended exploration angle even if there is a story right as i mentioned earlier if you do have a story then how does it evolve? Look at it as if it were not the history that's been um, analyzed and drilled down and sort of written about, but that messiness that's behind the scenes before some historians come in and peeled everything back and found the important threads. Just 
use that messiness and sort of embrace it. I think if you do that, then you know, basic is a great is a great game. Um, it certainly stood the test of time, and it's something that you can find I'll have a lot of fun fun with and tell a lot of different stories ultimately with uh, by just sort of em- embracing it and the game that it gives to you. So I hope I hope this has been useful. I, I feel like I talked for way too long. Again, let me know if I missed anything. Um, hopefully the sound levels were better. And like I said, I'll probably do more videos about more system agnostic game running things. I will probably do one on the white box because it is sort of fascinating, and interesting, and it is obviously the thing that started it all. And it does have a lot of stuff in there that maybe was lost a little bit as each iteration came and sort of polished it and sort of turned things to address different sorts of gamers or different sorts of things. So I probably will um, do something on that, but that's for another time. Uh, But thanks for listening and watching, and hopefully I will talk to you soon.